I want to welcome everyone to the first inaugural National Minority Research Symposium on Tobacco and Addictions. By this time you've all registered, I'm sure that you have received some warm Arkansas hospitality. I'm Dr. Valandra German and I want to thank all of you for gathering here today. At this time we are going to begin our program as printed. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here and all of you that decided you wanted to come up a little closer so that we can be more intimate in here. I am Mary E. Benjamin, the Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation, and Economic Development at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And it is my distinct pleasure to have an opportunity to welcome you to this, our first national symposium on tobacco and other addictions. Write it down bookmark it, <laughs> chop it on a tree, <laughs> that you participated in the first National Research Center on Tobacco and Addictions as sponsored by the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am here to greet you on behalf of that university and to tell you a little something about it. But before doing that, there are some people that we need to acknowledge. Uh, I wouldn't be standing here greeting you this morning. We are funded by the Arkansas Department of Health through the Master Tobacco Settlement Funding. And we have some of those people here today and I want to acknowledge them first. Not here is Dr. Nathaniel Smith, who is actually the director of that unit but he has a very capable person that walks beside him in that critical role that he plays, and that is Ms. Stephanie Williams. She is here. She will follow me and bring greetings to you on behalf of our funding agency. We also have Ms. Michelle Snortland, who is relatively new to this part of health care and health living in Arkansas, but she has hit the ground running in terms of tobacco and tobacco prevention. So with that said, let me just tell you a little bit about the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We are a land-grant institution with an HBCU heritage. And those are two important terms that I'll come back to as I extend my greetings to you. <clears throat> back in the early part of the year, the, the decade 2000, the university sat down and looked at what it was doing and how it could better serve that land grant mission and the land grant mission carries with it as our university teaching, research, and service. And we decided to take that concept and apply it to the area of tobacco, tobacco prevention, and healthy living. So how did we make that happen? In the area of teaching, we were able to establish a master's degree program in addiction studies. So that's our teaching part of our approach. We would not have been able to do that had it not been for the Master Tobacco Settlement Funding. And that funding is disseminated here in Arkansas and managed through the Arkansas Department of Health. We also, as a part of our land grant mission, believe in a heavy emphasis on service and outreach. So how did we do that? How did we integrate that into our mission? We created the Minority Initiative Subrecipient Grant Office, and we grant to more than 20 nonprofit agencies throughout the state of Arkansas, assuming that these agencies will do prevention work in the area of tobacco, and also assuming that they will form alliances with other agencies in their community, because their goal is community enhancement, community in commitment to 
tobacco prevention. So there's a heavy emphasis on youth, but also on adults. And then we had another component. So that's our outreach component. Remember I told you teaching, research, and service? So we're standing around and we're saying something is missing. We need that third component. We need research. And so we created the Minority Research Center on Tobacco and Addiction. And that center completed our tripod. In other words, we have a triple approach to the prevention of tobacco use and also a commitment to healthy Arkansans. Believe it or not, what we learn here in terms of healthy Arkansans can be replicated in many places. So today, you are here helping us to really bring to fruition the center. This is the first major research symposium put together by this center. And I would like to thank Dr. Valander German and her staff for bringing together a wonderful group of presenters from across this country to give you evidence-based information. We, wanna, we don't want to talk about what we think. And you know, I believe this could happen. We're going to give you information on what is happening and what is evidence-based. In other words, you can take it to the bank, <laughs> what you're going to be hearing today. And I just want to encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to talk, to ask questions, to listen. But most importantly, when you leave here, to be committed to use this information that you are going to receive. So let me thank the speakers for making a special effort to be here. Let me thank the funding agency for making this possible. And I want to thank each of you for making the decision to be here. Because to plan a symposium is one thing, to implement it is another. And we absolutely could not implement it without a wonderful, engaging audience. Thank you so much for being here. Enjoy this conference. Lead with a good word always for the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. As you can appreciate, Dr. Benjamin is clearly a hard act to follow. I am so inspired, and I appreciate your kind remarks, uh, Dr. Benjamin. I am Stephanie Williams. I'm the Deputy Director for Public Health Programs at the Department of Health, and it is a privilege and an honor to bring um, comments from the department on behalf of Dr. Nate Smith, who wasn't able to join us today. Uh, and also, I would like to recognize Dr. Gary Wheeler. Dr. Wheeler is the medical director for our tobacco prevention and cessation program at the department. And we thought he wasn't going to be able to be with us today because he's on call at Children's this week, but he has um, joined us. And so very pleased that Dr. Wheeler um, could be here uh, and represent the department. Um, this is, you know, such an important meeting, and as many of you know, tobacco is one of the leading causes of chronic diseases that plague our state. It is also the single most preventable cause of death. And, you know, that is, um, that's just huge. It is the single most preventable cause of death in our state. And so it's critical that, you know, in our efforts to protect and preserve the health of Arkansans, and, and to benefit um, women, children, uh, and men across the nation, that we understand the addiction and that we continue to work diligently to identify strategies that are effective at preventing the addiction and promoting cessation. So I commend you for taking the time to join us today um, for the first, our first national symposium. It feels great to say that. 
uh, and you know, hope that you will share your knowledge and expertise as participants. You know, we all have a unique perspective. So I would join Dr. Benjamin in encouraging you to share. And I would also like to thank Dr. German, Dr. Benjamin, and the staff of the Minority Research Center on Tobacco and Addictions for providing us such a great agenda that really is, um, is framed to stimulate learning, promote thought, dialogue, and to inspire us to act. So uh, again, I thank you. I hope you enjoy the day and have a great time. If this is your first visit to Little Rock, I can tell you it's not always this wet. Um, <laughs> if you stay around for the next day or two, I promise the sun will shine and hopefully you'll get to enjoy our very lovely city. So I hope you have a great conference and thank you for allowing me to make some remarks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Kawa, and I am pleased to present to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Philip Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a public health activist, administrator, evaluator, and researcher. For the past 25 years, he has worked on studies ranging from hypertension, multi multiculturalism, AIDS, breast cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes, and smoking. Dr. Gardner received his doctorate in behavioral sciences from the University of California at Berkeley, where he focused on youth violence as a public health issue. Dr. Gardner has maintained a community activism to address racial disparities in health through writing, organizing, evaluating, and public, health, public speaking. Excuse me. Currently, Dr. Gardner is the Policy and Regulatory Sciences and Neurosciences and Nicotine Dependence Program Officer for the Tobacco-Related Disease Research Program, University of California Office of the President. Dr. Gardner regularly speaks around the country on banning menthol cigarettes and regulating electronic cigarettes. And lastly, Dr. Gardner is the co-chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, a group of black professionals dedicated to fighting the scourge of tobacco impacting the African American community in California and nationally. Let us all welcome Dr. Philip Gardner. I teach a class on health disparities and I tend to walk around and talk about it. I don't have a clicker. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand up there and be like a great. Oh, I do have a clicker. <laughs> so let me just let me just say um, a couple of words of thanks. Um, I realize in putting this together, um, um, Dr. Moandra German, um, this is the first conference um, for my shop at the Tobacco-Related Disease Research Program. I organize a lot of conferences like this. Frankly, it takes a hell of a lot of work, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy to give up, sleep, things never go the way you plan, ever. You get calls from speakers like myself to give no sleep. Um, I don't know if I need them. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I can hear you. So yeah, I, re I really do want to thank um, Dr. Valandra, and um, she's mentioned to me that this could be a biannual event. I want us to all commit to not only helping her to do it in the future, but actually providing resources for it to happen, including staff, money, and the attention that there to do that with. Secondly, I'm going to talk to you about an issue today that most of you unfortunately are familiar about, the intractability of health disparities. Um, in my class on um, health disparities, I go back to colonial times, and we talk about the disparities between American Indians, um, white settlers, African slaves, the um, Mexican population, etc. And by 1850, some of the data that I'm going to show you this morning already existed. We're already 150 years into this mud hole, and. What you're being asked to do, or what I'm being asked to do, or what we're being asked to do, is how do we fight it? I think the economic, social, discriminatory um, demands that are placed on our population require that we be very creative, bold, and insightful in how we take this fight up. What I'm going to suggest to you is that we identify the weakest links um, in this problem. And as we go through this this morning, 
how to think how we can get ourselves out of this. Um, so this morning I'm going to start off talking about disaggregation of data. This is extremely important. There is a there is a demographic revolution taking place in the United States as we speak. We're going to have to understand that if we're going to take a tobacco-related disease control and research and apply it effectively. I'm going to argue that significant portions of the people who are smoking are being undercounted, such that the figures that we actually are confronted with actually might be a little worse than what we suspect. I'm going to talk about the disease burden confronting our communities. I'm going to then talk about predatory marketing. Um, I'm actually going to spend a, quite a while talking about predatory marketing because I think that's the main thing kind of going on. Um, I'm going to talk about menthol cigarettes and menthol products as it relates to that. I'm going to do a little introduction to a um, workshop that's going to be later this um, morning on that. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about electronic cigarettes. And I realize I've spent the last year or so talking about electronic cigarettes. And I don't have the, uh, I would love to spend the hour talking about that with you. I had a chance last Friday to talk at the University of California, San Francisco. And I'm, I got to talk about electronic cigarettes. And I realized there's people are crying out for information on it. I'm going to bring you a little information on it. You could twist somebody's arm to have me come back at another point, fill this room, and actually go into in-depth discussion on it, because we need it. Because it's the addiction of the 21st century, and it's going to come to a community near you soon. Do I know how this works? Okay. This is um, smoking prevalence in the United States today. This is the uh, morbidity mortality report of two times. This is February. These are the most recent data that we have. Um, African Americans, 18 percent. American Indians, Alaska Natives, 21. Asian Americans, 10. Hispanics, 12. Whites, 19. New category, multiracial. I work on another project in San Francisco, um, Asian Recovery Services. We've been collecting data over the last 10 years. Slowly that category of multiracial has gone up and up and up and up each year. It's going to go up and up in your communities too. There's no longer going to be these night neat categories. Given that, what I'm going to ask us to do this morning, the first thing we're going to do is disaggregate the figures that the CDC brings to us. The first one, we have Alaska Natives. Why they have 21 American Indians less than, why they have 21.8%, I don't know. We know that this is population has some of the largest um, use of tobacco products. If you disaggregate, if you just look at one scientific article from 2005, we find that, and this has been replicated in other studies, and I want to encourage that we all think about it, Northern Plains Indians smoke much more than Southern Plains Indians. People who, American Indians that live in Minnesota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, are smoking significantly more than folks living in Arizona and New Mexico. They always have. That's the nature of tobacco use in that community. As people who are going to do tobacco control work in these communities, then we have to take these things into account. And of course, things differ between men and women. Okay. The figures that you see for the women um, in the category of the Northern Plains seems to be higher than men. If we were to do this, and I've known folks in Alaska, you're going to find that actually tobacco use among women is extremely high. And it isn't smoking, it's chewing. Okay? And it's not only smoking and chewing, it's during pregnancy. This is how things are done. This is what was introduced to them. Tobacco is in the normal product, normal natural product in um, Alaska doesn't grow in the tundra. CDC figures on top, scientific figures disaggregated below. Somewhere with the Latino population. There's no such thing as one Latino population. It's disaggregated. Cubans smoke more. Of course, there's a history of tobacco growing on the island of Cuba. Um, 
take that into account. I'm going to show you some slides later on where we look at Puerto Ricans particularly. They're smoking menthol cigarettes off the chart almost to the same amount that African Americans. When it comes to Asian and Pacific Islanders, largest and fastest growing population um, in the United States. To say that their rates are 11.3 percent kind of misses the story when you look at Korean men and you look at Vietnamese men. Even though these figures are from an early California interview survey of over 13 years ago, the disaggregation of this is extremely important when you're dealing with the community. African Americans and blacks, as my colleagues from Africa will let you know, we are not black. <laughs> they are Africans. And you can see the difference in the smoking rates. Um, uh -oh. Is that right? Okay, so you, you can hear me, but you can't hear me. from the Caribbean and Africa together, you get an incorrect picture of the smoking rates among all of them. And in different parts of the United States, whether there's folks from the Caribbean, whether there's folks from West Africa, South Africa, East Africa, we have to disaggregate them, and that's the only point of this slide. Now I'm going to stay. I, I really can talk this off. It's really wild. It's very, very wild, very wild. So, even if we disaggregate them, it's going to be important that we actually understand what's happening. What you have in front of you is um, some data from the Centers for Disease Control, some articles written by researchers, Dr. Yerger being one of them, where we look at RDDTS, random digit dialing telephone surveys, is the way data is usually collected about smoking in the United States. The problem with this is, as we can see, um, the CDC found, and Gilpin and Pierce found, and we wonder if this works, 8 to 13 percent tobacco, tobacco cigar use um, amongst African Americans. But when Dr. Yerger did a community survey, same place in California, we found 32 to 44 percent. This is strikingly different. Okay. Similarly, adult smoking rates were found to be 22%. But Dale, this is a great article. You guys, if you're into the science of tobacco control, look at Dale's article, 2005, American Journal of Public Health. They go door to door in Chicago and ask people about their smoking. I mean, it's almost 40%. Copeland Dream found the same thing. We're going to look at her slide, uh, too. The importance of this is undercounting that they're undercounting African American smokers, they're undercounting other communities of color, they're undercounting poor people, they're undercounting the LGBT community, they're undercounting people that don't fit the mold. You are going to take care of either the research and or the the fight against have to understand these distinctions, or we all should understand this distinction. This is a um, study found. This is a study funded by uh, my organization uh, where we compare, uh, I don't like this thing, um, we compare what our sister program, the California Department of um, Tobacco Control data, which found that 19% of blacks were smoking and 13% of whites were smoking. And then 
we found doing the same thing that Dell and folks had done in Chicago, essentially going somewhat door to door in the land, um, census tracts in California, that 33% of blacks were smoking. Okay. And in fact, we found even higher rates of white smoking. So when you get on the ground, you're going to get a little better picture. I want to encourage us all to get on the ground to be able to do that. The problem with this type of um, this type of research, I think random digit dialing has its place, but I'm going to suggest to you that when you're dealing with poor people and you're dealing with folks of color that they're moving around a lot, they don't have a lot of landlines, there's a higher incarceration rate, people that are doing school studies, our communities are, for lack of a better term, episodically in school, um, and there's heck of a lot more use of cigars and blunts. We all know what cigars and blunts are, right? I would suggest to you that this is going on more often than not. In a second study published last year by um, Dr. Landry and some other colleagues of ours, um, Denise Adam Sims is on both of these, um, is that 49% of black cigarette smokers said that they used other tobacco products, but most importantly is that nearly 15% of folks who didn't say they smoked cigarettes said they had used a cigar, a cigarillo, or a blunt. They're smoking. They don't see themselves as smokers. Okay? If you add the undercount with the blunt and the cigar and the cigarillo use, you've got a lot going on in our community. And we know what loosings are. You can go buy a loose cigarette. You can buy a cigarette, you can buy a loose blunt, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about addiction. Um, I'm also the neurosciences program officer for um, the University of California. Have been, even though I'm not a trained neuroscientist, after um, 18 years of this, I'm actually very familiar with it. Let me just suggest to you there's some unique things going on with the African American population. My sense is, not my sense, I actually know that there's unique things going on with all populations. So, I want to encourage us to look at it. But as it relates to African Americans, they smoke fewer cigarettes per day. We've known this for years. They take fewer puffs of cigarettes. There's a slower metabolism of the metabolite of nicotine company in the African American system. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in one second. Hello. Okay. Are, are we better? Yes. Okay, we're better. Is it loud enough or did it come down some? It's just identify. Okay. So, you say something now? <laughs> we know that African Americans tend to smoke cigarettes that have not higher nicotine account. I appreciate the comments of the, of the opening speaker who said the what I bring, what I bring when I talk are the facts. These are, these are my ideas. This is stuff that has been measured um, over time. These are the citations. Slides are available to everybody. Please look it up. Let's act on them um, and the like. African Americans start smoking later in life. Have the highest rates of menthol use of anybody. I resemble that remark. Um, I didn't start smoking until 19 after I stopped playing basketball. Of course, I was out of the house because even though both my parents went, you weren't going to smoke that was just a non starter. Uh, that was just a no. Uh, so, this is the reality of it. Let me talk about a little, just a little biology here. Um, difference of coping, clearance, and half life of nicotine. Um, this is African Americans. This is by this um, Perez Estable, colleague of mine, UCSF, actually a friend, even before he was a colleague. Um, the punchline of this slide is that the metabolite of nicotine stays in the African American body longer than it does in whites. It means it's in there doing things, interacting with enzymes in the liver. What that gives rise to, some of us think, gives rise to greater tobacco related diseases, which we will show you here in a second. Nicotine per cigarette. Um, notice that the nicotine, this is what I just mentioned to you, the, the third line. 
there's greater nicotine in the type of cigarettes that are smoked than amongst the white population. And if the nicotine stays in the body longer, then you're just having more, you know, more insult to the body. These are the latest um, cohort, 2005-2009, American Cancer Society. What is the impact of this stuff that we've been talking about in tobacco control? Unfortunately, this slide says it too well. We might, I spend, this is an introductory slide that I do in my class. We take this slide and a couple others that I'm going to do, and we spend the whole class, maybe 45 minutes, going through four slides because of the richness of it. African Americans' incidence is the greatest across the board. This is the incidence where I like to focus, unfortunately, is the death rate or the mortality, as it were. Um, African Americans' death rate from cancer is somewhat off the chart. It's not even somewhat off the chart. It is off the chart. And if you look at African American women, it's greater than Hispanic men, and almost as much as American Indian men. So there's something going on in terms of, um, and as uh, people have pointed out, well, not all cancers are caused by uh, tobacco smoking. That's correct. What we do know, and I didn't put this slide up here, what we do know is in the African American community that somewhere in the neighborhood of 68% to 70% of all cancers are due to smoking. I have the day, I found this article. Um, we have a gentleman we funded, um, he did a great study on this. So this is reflected what you're dealing with. This is what we have to be confronted with. Um, I would suggest to you that late diagnosis, that extreme burden, greater body burden on the amount of nicotine, type of cigarette smoke, health literacy or lack thereof, being afraid of the uh, health system, Roll it all up into one, this is what you come out with for black men. I can show you this for diabetes, I can show you this for AIDS, I can show you this across the board. If you're dealing with a special population, and just having one topic here today. So I'm sitting at my desk, it's 19, 1998, Surgeon General's report, Satcher comes out, we have an African American Surgeon General. I'm flipping through it, I'm saying, my God, here are age adjusted rates for tobacco-related diseases. This is oral cancer, esophageal cancer, lung cancer, coronary heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, stroke. Across the board, African-American men, across the board, African-American men had the highest rates. Of course, across the board, if you look at the Hispanic reading of this, which is a whole other lecture that I do, because <laughs> there's reasons for these things. The health disparities associated with it, less cigarette use, different types of cigarette use, different often cigarette use, immigration status, all sorts of things. But what I took away from this, is someone asked me in 2003 or 2004, he said, well, that's five years ago. What about some more later data? So I said, well, no, maybe things had changed. Maybe Satcher, you know, this was an aberration. So we looked at 2007. These are incidence rates. These are our groups. Again, African-American men, the highest and the focus on the lung cancer side. At some level, the incidence of lung cancer is almost double that of certain groups. And the mortality rate is almost triple that of some of those. Okay. Health disparities. These are concrete health disparities from this. There's, um, I could have brought you up to date with 2010 data. American Cancer Society has a great pamphlet out, pamphlet out, a great booklet out on African Americans, Latinos, and other um, folks smoking in 2010. Same data. Same thing. So it's not just a question of getting the disease, it's also a question of treating the disease. This is just one slide. 
There's many slides like this. Early stage, non-small lung cancer, and a number of different patients pairing African Americans and whites. Survival rate much greater for whites. Significant improvement. The treatment differences. Health disparities. Treatment disparities. This is heart disease. Outside of our poor diets, me included, um, smoking is one of the main risk factors for coronary heart disease. Um, African Americans, again, lead the chart in terms of this. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Um, Hispanics are making a run for the money, unfortunately, too. There's a whole discussion about secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is a uh, class A carcinogen, a known killer. Um, I would just suggest to you in broad strokes that secondhand smoke affects communities of color disproportionately. Um, poor people, African Americans, and my colleague Wendy Max at the University of California um, a tobacco um, epidemiologist and economist shows that Latino smokers are disproportionate. Latina households and homes and people are dis disproportionately exposed to um, secondhand smoke. Often they work in industries where smoking is not controlled. <coughs> you need to just keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to switch reels here. I'm going to use this as an introduction. Some of you have a chance. There's going to be a workshop later today, or right after this, on um, the menthol buffer zone um, by Dr. Valerie Yerger and my co-chair, um, Carol Bruder. And they're going to discuss um, what this buffer zone is about. I'm going to do a little bit more of the history then about menthol when I was here before and, um, with um, Captain um, Donald. Um, I went into this in some depth, but I think the punchline is, where did all the smoking in the African American community come? The, the, the one sentence answer is the pushing by the tobacco industry to increase the rate of menthol use. If you look at these figures, and these figures are all documented, these aren't again my figures. In, in 1953, 5% of African Americans used menthol cigarettes. Interesting to note, in 1953, 3% of white Americans used menthol cigarettes. There was already a little difference between folks. What the tobacco industry did was manipulate that little, industry, that little difference and exploded it into the difference you see today. By 1968, it tripled. By 1976, it tripled again. By 1990 and above, it doesn't. There was a huge play going on. What we're going to do in the workshop a little bit later is go into detail of why that happened and where, and where that came from. But this is targeted marketing. This is the ample ramifications of it. Target marketing looks like this. This is a slide from Wright, um, who worked, uh, Ms. Wright worked at, um, it was Brown and Williamson then before it was bought by, um, Reynolds. Um, they had the distinction between focus groups and non-focus groups, or focus communities and non-focus communities. Focus communities were inner city, poor, colored. Things were cheaper there, more promotions there, and you got greater discounts there. Non-focus communities were upscale, suburban, and white. And you got fewer discounts or not as many discounts. The punchline of this focus, <coughs> the punchline of the focus and non-focus communities is that cigarettes are cheaper in focus communities. This is what you call target marketing. If you're poor, make it easy to get the poison. Okay. That's the name of this too. This is research funded by the University of California again, Lisa Herrick Henriksen at Stanford where we have a dose-response relationship. We have a dose-response relationship. As the enrollment of African-American kids went up, 
the marketing of menthol cigarettes went up proportionally. They did this around each school in California. <coughs> this is not just true in California. Those response relationships. They found that Newport discounts were 1.5 times greater because they were in focus communities. Again, focus communities. Um, the menthol advertising increased by nearly 6%. Newport promotions, of course, were higher. But the key point here is Newport costs were 12 cents lower. It's found all throughout California. Well, you say this is a California phenomenon. Switch coasts. This is looking at um, Boston, Massachusetts. Looking at two communities, Brookline and Dorchester. Dorchester, historically African-American, even though more diverse now, still colored, essentially, a focused community. We find that retail ads, they were more in Dorchester. There were more larger ads in Dorchester. There were three times, four times as many menthol ads. And of course, the punchline again, the cigarettes were 50 cents cheaper. OK. Focus on Health experience. My favorite thing. It's a website. This is the cigarette company. This is predatory marketing. At its best, brazen to say the least, grown-ups should have the freedom to choose whether to smoke regular menthol cigarettes. His assistant in dread, telling you, so you have a right to choose. You can kill yourself any way you want. <laughs> Feel power. Outrageous. Predatory market. But it's not just African Americans using them. menthol cigarettes. Menthol cigarettes are being smoked by youth, being smoked by women. Women are the main smokers. In fact, what's interesting in the tobacco industry documents, it was one of the tricks they were trying to figure out in the big marketing to African Americans. In the 1930s, I'm going to do this later today in the workshop. In the 1930s, menthol was mainly popularized as a um, specialty project, often targeted toward women. And what they were able to accomplish 30 years later, 40 years later, is turn it around and have it as a specialty product that is targeted mainly to African-American men. That was very slick on their part. Um, this, um, this data was presented at the second menthol conference. 82% um, of African-Americans are using menthol cigarettes, smokers. That's an incredible percentage, 82 percent. And they go down as we kind of look at this slope. But when we come back to the youth, you're going to see it go back up. And I think that's actually what's important in this. Kids smoke the most menthols. Um, 12 to 17 year olds, nearly 50 percent of folks, any kids of any ethnicity, are smoking menthol cigarettes. Kids like candy flavors. That's what attracts them to cigarettes. This is not new, but this is the science behind it. It's James Hershey, Research Triangle International, um, found that mentholated cigarettes were a starter product. That in middle school, 58, nearly 60% of kids who said that they never had tried a cigarette before, the first cigarette that they tried was a menthol cigarette. That's where it began. That's how you get it started. But this should be our take on the slide. These are percent of menthol use amongst 12 to 17 year olds. I think the take home message for me here is African American kids, sure, it's 71 or 72 percent, but multiracial above 50, Asian American above 50. Hispanic have actually calculated it's out at 47 percent, and Hawaiian, um, I'm going to show you some separate figures on that, is even higher than that. All the kids are doing it. All the kids. Give you a sense of what's really happening in the targeted marketing wars is this slide. If you notice, the, uh, the lighter bars are for middle school and the blue the blue bars are for high school. And if you notice menthol use goes down from 
middle school to high school in every group here, except for African Americans, it goes up. Meaning that there's something not only taking place, remember it was 72% in middle school, and it jumps to 82% in adulthood. That that push, that targeted marketing, is really then taking hold. That's essentially what happened, uh, at least in my case, at least what the data shows. Uh, it's a great study done by Del Novo and folks in New Jersey, um, this aggregation of the um, Hispanic and Mexican American population. And lo and behold, what do we find? That 62% of Puerto Ricans are using menthol products. 62%. While there may not be a lot of Puerto Ricans in, um, in Little Rock, there are a lot of Puerto Ricans on the East Coast, and in New Jersey, and in New York, and a growing number in the Bay Area. Um, and they're not to be confused with the Spanish population, or the Mexican-American Spanish population. What about Hawaii? I mean, this was, <laughs> blew me away. And this is from 2009, I'm sure this continues. Look at the middle row menthol use between middle school and high school over the decade of the 2000s, of the odds, that there's an increasing rise of menthol use to the point of almost being 80% in high school in Hawaii. Native Hawaiians are using menthol cigarette products. In fact, talking to some Native Hawaiians, that's, a, that's true. And the same thing that they did for doing in the African American community, they're doing in Native American. Filipinos. 55% of the Filipino market for tobacco is on menthol. 55%. It's for all Filipinos. This um, cigarette, Marlboro menthol lights and Filipino menthols, they dominate the market. In fact, Philippines, of course, the Philippines serves as the hub for South, Southeast Asia, where they have, in, in Manila, Philip Morris and other parts of the tobacco industry are sending scientists to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to Thailand, to Guam, that this is their base of operations. If we want to actually get something done, we might want to target Manila. I'm going to end my remarks by talking about the e-cigarette explosion. And I, I, I feel, I didn't put any, I don't want to say science, I didn't put any um, chemical composition things up here. I really wanted to, I just felt it would take us down another road. Suffice it to say, what you're dealing with is not just water vapor, you're dealing with what we would call nicotine-laced propylene glycol that, when you heat it up, releases the same type of chemicals in a cigarette, just essentially on a lesser amount. It's the short, short sentence. But what we're confronted with, if we're going to deal with health disparities, that this is, the, this is the train that's going to come to us next. We're ahead of the curve right now. Right now, most of the studies show that disproportionately whites Middle, in the middle age, um, millennials, um, younger people, um, and the like are the ones doing electronic cigarettes. But they're going to come to the community near you soon. Um, what do we know is that by 2017, it'll be a $10 billion industry. And some analysts are suggesting that it'll overtake the, um, the consumption or production of um, of regular cigarettes by 2020, 2023. Now these are all projections and there'll be up and ups and downs in all of this. But my sense is that, and, and just to give the cigarette companies their due, $10 billion industry in 2017, the, the, the tobacco industry itself as a whole, $100 billion. $10 billion is a tenth of it. Seems small, but things are changing. Things are moving. And this is just to give you a sense of what you're going to be confronted with. Tobacco, tobacco, e-cigarette advertising tripled in one year. 
2011 to 2012, from 18.3 million, from 6.4 million to 18.3. One year, triple. 80 unique brands were sold or advertised, blue cigarette being one, over 75% of that. That was 2011 to 2012. The next year, 2012 to 2013, it doubled again. You're noticing the pattern. Remember what I did with the menthol? They know what they're doing with this. This is a game. They've done this before. They're rolling this out. You're going to be you're going to be confronted. With it. it doubled again from to around 59.3 million dollars being added. We have a new phenomenon coming up. It's called vape shops, or what we're called the Starbucks of the flavor. Okay? You know what Starbucks are. You go to the coffee shop, have a donut, pop open your computer, sit down, talk to your friends, run your mouth. It's estimated that five to 10,000 vape shops have opened up just in the last few years in the United States. You can hang out, work, have a cup of coffee, it's the same thing. They've done this before. You can purchase products. You can try new vapor. You can mix your own. You can roll your own, for lack of a better term. Um, you can mix your own, as I call it. Um, you can eat and drink. Imagine this coming to an African-American community, a Latino community, an Asian-American community. It's already happening. In the kind of use of it. CDC reported last fall that this has taken off in middle school. It has jumped from 4.7% to 10% by 2012. We're in 2014 now. It's even larger than that. I'm sure you guys have all have experience with that. Nearly 2 million kids had tried this in 2012, but I guess the take home for me in all of these figures is 76.3 percent of the people who are smoking actual, actual tobacco cigarettes also are the smokers or the vapors of e-cigarettes. The dual use starts in the beginning. Unfortunately, I think it'll continue. I hope it doesn't, but data speaks for itself. Notice the stuff I presented today. It's all been about data. Only now and then do you hear that I think you're going. <laughs> or, or cats, or whatever I think they are. But they, their data speaks for themselves. Okay. Um, we could be putting any color in this one. So who's using these products? Why am I bringing this up at a health disparities con? I had, to, I had to really kind of work this through. Um, more women than men are using them. Asian identity more than white. And when I went back and looked at this, this is a Pam Ling study at uh, UCSF. This is a nationwide representative sample. This wasn't just California, meaning there's a trend there. In fact, e-cigarettes, knock on wood, were created by a Chinese physician. There's a certain um, identification of that, but that's just where we are right now. People 18 to 29 years of age are using them more than some of us um, geezers, uh, most of us geezers. Uh, People with some college education, meaning little college education, are using it more than people who have a BA or better. People with less than 15,000 poor people are using these compared to people who make more money. Similar. Article came out on Monday. Um, folks at Roswell Park in, um, in New York found that e-cigarettes are disproportionately used by people with um, mental illness. Um, actually, next week I'm going to be speaking at a conference on behavioral health where I'm going to go into the e-cigarettes thing in much greater depth because there's a debate not only breaking out amongst us all, but particularly in the mental health community since mental health people are smoking disproportionately more than anybody, consuming more cigarettes than anybody, people are saying, are rushing, and I don't put that mildly, are rushing to embrace these cigarettes as a way to maybe protect this population. 
and it may be a bit a rush a bit too soon. And then lastly, I'm going to end with some images, um, unfortunately, that we have to take home. I wasn't going to, I couldn't put all the images up here I wanted, but already the targeted marketing has begun and targeting our community. This is why quit, switch to blue. Um, they have another one that says, don't quit, switch to blue. Okay. So and that's exactly what they want you to do. They don't want you to quit. You know, you can have it, you can have it electronically, you can have an analog, you know. Um, but as long as you don't quit, or why quit, switch to blue. E-cigars. I don't need a light, baby. It's an electronic cigarette. You think they're targeted just to a certain group of people? We haven't seen it yet, but it'll come. And this is why I'm doing this, and there had to be a way to integrate this. We could not have a discussion on health disparity as important as it is, and not talk about the newest and fastest growing thing out there. I'll save my rest of my speech to the very end. One more. Young kids on the street using electronic cigarettes, vapor. So Latina, out of an ad for electronic cigarettes, who do you think that they take? And I believe lastly, it's an Asian American woman with a blue cigarette. My sense is that um, this is where we are in the fight against tobacco. Um, it's taken on, a, in, the, in the course of the fight against tobacco, it's become a discussion about nicotine. Um, I would suggest to you that we don't know the long-term health effects of electronic cigarettes, and I would fight with you strongly to wait until the science is out before you decide which way to go but follow the science wherever it goes. We don't know what it means to inhale propylene-laced or nicotine-laced propylene glycol for 10 years, 300 plus a day. We don't know. You don't know. I don't know. I would love, I would see, unfortunately, numerous animal studies where if done properly, we could figure this out in two or three years. But we have to have a research agenda that actually does that. Um, I'm hoping to convince folks at the University of California to undertake such a research agenda. We don't have 15 years to find out. We don't want to wait like light cigarettes that were going to save the world. Of course, it gave you a different type of lung cancer than the type of lung cancer that came. With that said, I want to thank you. I put a lot on your plate this morning. Again, let me thank um, Orlando um, and her staff. Um, for the and um, I'll take any questions at this. I realized I've been mainly for the last year talking about electronic cigarettes and hadn't really updated my work on health disparities. Secondly, um, hookah bars are a growing phenomenon um, in the United States and not only particularly around college campuses where there are a lot in California, but with the influx of folks from the Middle East, North Africa, and parts of um, other parts of Asia, it's becoming a staple. Um, in fact, the restaurant that's in the thought about it, that's on the first floor 
of the building I work in, part of also the president is in the Kaiser Center in Oakland. Um, the, um, the Lebanese gentleman there who um, owns the restaurant has a big picture of himself at a birthday party, him smoking a hookah. It's a huge picture. It's standard. Um, and this, and I'm going to broaden your question because you're right on the money, and I appreciate how nicely you asked me. I didn't talk about bees. I didn't talk about food. I didn't talk about barrettes. I didn't talk about a lot of other tobacco products. As we move into the 21st century, increasingly these things are going to come to fore. Different groups of people are going to be using them. People that may not have the same opportunities that you have. Um, so, no, yes, no. The vape, the vape shops are different than the, the hookah bars. Um, we, were, we tried to get a loophole closed in California um, that would have made it illegal to use hookah bars, to, to smoke hookah inside, indoors. And given the influence of the tobacco industry in Sacramento, we were not able to get that passed. Um, we may be able to go back now, but it's a growing thing, and I, I appreciate your question. I, I'm just going to piggyback off of what you're just talking about, because I was sitting here thinking about the Starbucks. We have Starbucks, Starbucks all over the country, where you just go and get your coffee, sit, talk, socialize. And I was saying, my thought was, how do we? Said the vape shops are coming. In some places, they're already there. So my thinking was, how do we get on top of it, or how do we begin to move in that direction in terms of not allowing the vape shops to come into our communities, into our setting? So I, my question is, do you have any suggestions or any ideas or thoughts? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, yes, um, what I've been doing, and this is what I do, right? You guys are plants. You guys have been in my mind for the last uh, <laughs> few days. What I've done for the last six or seven months is go around and testify to different city councils around the country on the importance of regulating electronic cigarettes. And part of that regulation is not allowing indoor vaping. Um, right back to the same point. Um, that's why it's a piggyback. Some places we've been able to eliminate vape shops. Other places they've been, what do you call it, they've been made an exception. It's a political question. I want to encourage you, because this will come up a little wrong. You can come have me testify. I did it in Chicago. They passed the law. I did it in, I was supposed to do it in Los Angeles. It got fogged in, but they used my talking point. We did it in San Francisco. We did it in Richmond. California. California, yes. <laughs> go, go Valerie. <laughs> um, you have to let it split. It's a bit. As much as I'm a scientist, I am a political activist, too. And that the way you have to deal with this is the fight. You want to keep people from, if you don't want to be exposed to secondhand vaping, and we know that secondhand vaping contains a lot of the same chemicals that are in secondhand smoke, then we have to pass laws against it. That means getting with politicians, which some of you are politicians in here, and figure out how to get the requisite votes necessary to keep vaping. Um, if you want to, if people want to buy electronic vape, the um, FDA missed, I think, a great opportunity last week when they came up with the deeming regulations. Um, while there is a framework set up, as um, my partner, Rich Zeller, said, they still can be sold um, anywhere. Kids can still buy them. Flavors are still in them. It's still the same thing. In fact, the analysts from Wall Street Journal all the way to Wells Fargo and to uh, Citibanker, she's a great. We need more of that. I, so my answer to you is a political question to be regulated. Sir. You've made a nice case for menthol as an introductory agent to smoking in minority populations. Do we have any examples in this country or elsewhere where menthol sales or advertising have been banned and where we've been able to document a reduction in uptake of uh, tobacco products? We have the former. The latter is, since, since the former is just most recent, we don't have any of the latter. So the question is, 
If we were able to restrict menthol sales, would we see the incidence of their use and hopefully the soliloquy after that go down? What we're able to do in Chicago, and I think this is what Valerie and Carol are going to talk about in their workshop, is that they are able to pass a 500 foot buffer zone around all schools in Chicago, meaning you can't sell menthol, you can't sell flavored tobacco products, because that's what's attractive to kids. Um, this law just passed in December of last year. It's only going to be implemented in June of this year. Um, we're coming to find out there are so many candy flavorings. It's not just menthol, but can candy. There's so many candy flavorings in um, tobacco that they're actually doing an inventory of all the different, you know, blunts that have this type of wrapper on it and Swisher Sweets and mentholoid cigarettes this and dun 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 to that to actually categorize them so you can actually do it. Then there comes the question of enforcement. You're going to have a guard at every store, every truck that is delivered. Not sure how this is all going to work, but that's one way to do it. What has been the outcome? It's only being implemented now. I was just talking with uh, Catherine. Let's do, let's do, let's do it here in, in Little Rock. Let's try and get a 500 foot barrier. Why it worked in Chicago is given how concentrated our things are right across the street. When they tried a thousand feet in New York, the New York court, both the lower and the appeals court overruled it because it would impede commerce given when you're in a concentrated area. When you're in a less concentrated area, like Little Rock, and Little Rock is essentially the same size as Oakland, you might need a 750 foot barrier. But you need to work with your lawyers, understand what the legal precedent has been for, what went on in Chicago, and what's the actual difference between liquor stores and kids access to them, and build a case around it. So I think we should try and do it here. We're going to talk to folks in New York about it. Um, I thought your question's right on the money. Ma'am, you had a question? Yes, thank you for your uh, talk today. I actually just wanted to know, if we had a map of the United States, would we be able to chart where those big bars are popping up? Yes. Um, in short, right now, you have concentrations in New York, Los Angeles, the Bay Area. I, you saw the piece on Oklahoma, where there's uh, we're not sure why Oklahoma, but there's a huge number of vape shops in Oklahoma. New Mexico, Arizona, and some of these that follow, not to get, Dan is always important. What the tobacco industry has been doing over the last three years is test marketing electronic cigarettes. Views from Reynolds was test marketed in Colorado so successfully that the main selling e-cigarette in Colorado in the Denver area is Views, as opposed to Blue, which is the leading one elsewhere. Philip Morris has been test marketing Mark 10 in Phoenix and has been doing it for the last six or seven months with an expected rollout, nationwide rollout, sometime later this year. So you can follow the test marketing test market here, set up a vape shop here. Um, I suppose if you wrote me and I could find some time on my agenda, I could send you the information. Because um, someone's done the science. There's always data, you just have to find it. Though. Good point. Other questions? Yeah. Is there a reason why the nicotine stays in African Americans longer than it does in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> These bad old bad African Americans. <laughs> Um, yeah, it has to do with, we have a um, certain enzyme in our liver that doesn't allow the metabolism of the nicotine um, at the same rate as in other folks. Um, so there's an allele that we lack. It's not lack, it's just that we don't have. And if you don't have it, it just goes slower. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but if you're in, taking in nicotine, then it just stays in your body longer. Yeah, there's a, there's an underlying biological reason that it isn't. A, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's just a story. Just, <laughs> did you want to say something? I can add to it. Please, um, Dr. Yerger, um, Valerie Yerger, UC San Francisco. I'm a tobacco documents researcher, 
So one of the things that I did early on was to try to figure out um, why African Americans were metabolizing nicotine slower than the rest of the population. So I went into the documents because the industry has money and they study a lot of things. And sure enough, I found studies that they had funded uh, where they were looking at the distribution of nicotine in animal tissues and found out that those tissues that contain melanin accumulated nicotine. Um, so I wrote a paper early on, um, 2004 or six, and um, Gary King at um, Penn State um, did a small study and show, so now we have evidence to show that um, African Americans who tend to have higher levels of melanin because we tend to have darker skin, um, we accumulate um, more of the nicotine and it's been associated, strong significant association with um, nicotine dependence, um, um, nicotine exposure, and smoking behavior. Um, but you have to also understand that there are different types of melanin. And those melan types of melanin that are activated by the sun, those are the ones that have been um, shown to be related to nicotine dependence and not necessarily the constitutive melanin, which is what we get um, um, genetically. So, so there is definitely a strong relationship there. But let me just take it one, so thank you, Valerie. I think the, it's specifically an answer to your question. So when you put the fact of the melanin with this allele that is lacking, you get it staying in the body. You have more of it there anyway, and then it stays in there longer. This is just a fact. You know, if we didn't smoke, if you didn't smoke, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> but that's, that's another issue. Sir. <coughs> keynote address was both informative and it will have an immediate impact on the research agenda here at the Minority Research Center. At this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Gardner to come back to the stage, please. 
Arkansas have Arkansans have long been known for their hospitality and their love of their beautiful state. And this certificate expresses the state's regard for individuals whose contributions to the progress, enjoyment, or well-being of the state of Arkansas that merit special recognition. So it's my honor to present to you today an Arkansas Traveler Award. <laughs> Arkansas Traveler, I like that. Right, I don't know if it'll get you out of a speeding ticket, you can try. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know it don't get you out of a speeding ticket. <laughs> thank you again, okay, Dr. Gardner. I was so excited we made the phone call. When we made the phone call to Dr. Gardner to call and ask him, I was so nervous, of course, after reading his work over the years, and he answers his own phone, and he's not pretentious at all, and he's like, oh, yeah, sure, just tell me when and where to show up. I'll come. I was like, that easy, huh? So we're really excited about that today.